This is Audio Immunity, a podcast about our body's never-ending fight with the outside world. Hi everyone, this is Audio Immunity, recorded on November 29th, 2017. I'm Kevin Bonham, and I'm joined, as per usual, by Matt Woodruff. Hello everyone. Kevin, you sound terrible. Yeah, I feel pretty terrible, Matt. Um, I have a gnarly head cold, and so I apologize to all of you out there in audio land, um, but I'm going to be sounding like a frog for most of this episode. Um, <laughs> and it's great, because I'm presenting the paper too, so... Uh, Hope you enjoy it. Also joining us this evening is uh, Chadine Tremeglio. Hello. Hello. And I'm still not super confident with that last name. So uh, if I ever... <laughs> it's, it's a tough one. If I ever muck it up, you know, feel free to just um, auditorily smack me over the head. I will. Uh, I will right now. It's it's actually Tremaglio. <laughs> Tremaglio? <laughs> that's, yeah. that's okay, Kevin. Tremaglio. You can have a pass. <laughs> Tremaglio. Okay. Cool. And also joining us, another hard-to-pronounce name, but I'm going to see what I can do, Camilla Engblom. It's all good, Kevin. Okay, thanks. How are you? I'm good, thanks. I think I'm better than you, actually. Yeah, Yeah. well, that's not hard uh, to accomplish. (laughs) (coughs) Don't worry, I will will edit out all of the cops. Are things infectious through microphones? Not that we've seen so far. (laughs) All right. Um, And... um, as we get into what everybody is drinking tonight, um, because I have this gnarly head cold, I am not drinking alcohol. I am drinking Cold Care PM tea, um, which is quite soothing with a little dollop of honey. I will not be getting drunk, but I feel pretty out of it already. So I apologize for any incoherence. It is not on account of alcohol this time. <laughs> Matt, what are you drinking tonight? I've actually got some tea as well. Uh, currently, <sighs> I've we are got terrible. a... Uh, a wife who has pink eye and a pretty rad adeno infection and a son who is just kind of getting over it as well. So I'm not going to tempt fate and I'm going to get some sleep tonight. That seems reasonable, <laughs> yeah, I suppose. Very responsible, Matt. Very good. Emily, Emily is an ophthalmologist and has pink eye and, one, <laughs> oh, and, and wondered That's if ironic. she should go into work. <laughs> I was like... <laughs> Well, (laughs) I don't know. I guess you can make that call. (laughs) Do they not have, don't doctors have like public health training? Like, isn't that like one of the first things you should learn as a doctor? Not to spread highly communicable infectious diseases? I've learned that all of those things are not self-applicable. No, they're not. That's correct. Ah. Yeah, it's for everyone else who's sick, but not you. Yes. Right, including other physicians. Yes. Right. (laughs) They judge each other. (laughs) Right. Cool. Yep. So, and Shadeen, did you manage to um, acquire a beer that your husband did not steal this I time? I did not. No, I, I too am drinking tea tonight. It seems like we're the teetotaling crowd tonight. I have a honey vanilla wah, wah. chamomile because I am just getting over a gnarly head cold. Oh, is that so the celestial that... seasoning one? Season? Yes. Oh, that's wow, my favorite. You're good. <laughs> oh no, that's my favorite one. It is. It is pretty fabulous. I really dig the herbal teas. You know, close to bedtime, so that I don't get all ramped up on caffeine. And this one is just great. It is delicious. That one and the tension tamer was a strong. Ooh. You know what? My <laughs> other favorite. School. <laughs> my other favorite is the apple cinnamon spice. Mm. It tastes like the fall. It is so good. I feel like <laughs> audio immunity has taken a turn. I we was thinking the same thing. <laughs> um, we did invite them on, though. Right? So we sure did. Sure Next did. time, I will have a beer. I swear. <laughs> I promise. All right. I'm going to hold you to that. Uh, I will as well. Camilla. Are you are you gonna rescue this crowd? Well, you make you have me some you make me look beverage? like a drunk, really. So I do have a beer, <laughs> yes. and yes. and it had a really funny name, and but I forgot it, and it's now in the kitchen, so I can look it up later. But it was something what? about tempting fate, I think. Hmm. You're local... supposed to have the beer with you it's while a, recording it's the in podcast. A glass. <laughs> I see. Okay, that's fair. So, that's pushy, that's acceptable. Pushy. But I will go and look at it later, and then I will. Okay. But I'm also drinking a decaf coffee and some water because oh, I'm also old. tripling it up. Yeah, that it's a little quite, crowded quite on my the table. Mix. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, all right, my brain is not functioning. Um, what are we doing next? We can give our thanks. Give thanks. Yes, perfect. Because it was just Thanksgiving, so we mm. have to give ah, some thanks. Nice. Very good. <laughs> right. Okay. Super awkward, but we'll go with it. Um, we <laughs> do like have it. to give thanks to our 
only four so far, but growing number of Patreon supporters. Um, I posted the last episode just before leaving for California on a plane, um, and by the time I had landed, we'd already had someone donating, um, and then by the end of the week, we have now four people donating. We have enough that we are um, covering the cost if people continue to support at the level they are we are going to not go into debt making audio immunity in other words <laughs> we're going to be able to pay for web hosting and someday maybe you know if we did this podcast for 30 years we'd be able to recoup the costs we've already put into it yeah but that's... if any of you other wonderful people want to donate you can go to patreon.com slash audio immunity and kick in a 50 cents per episode, a dollar per episode. We have one patron supporter giving us $5 per episode, which is Whoa. amazing. Thank you That's for that. Thank you. Thank you. So, and, and you can set limits. So you can say, you know, I want to give $2 an episode, but only up to $4 a month or something like that. All of it's good. Um, it's super helpful to us. It helps motivate us to make the show. Um, even when we have viruses coursing through our bodies and an immune system that makes us feel like crap. And we've been trying to come up with some rewards to give to our Patreon supporters. And we've come up with a couple of ideas. But honestly, we'd love to hear from you guys what you think would be good rewards for Patreon supporters. I marked up this paper that we're going to do with a ton of highlights. Um, and I can share the annotated PDF, although that's not super exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, you had a suggestion as well. Yeah, so we have discussed a couple times, I think, in the past of putting together some uh, sort of complementary material that go with the discussions that we have over the course of a paper. And I know that after most shows, we sort of look back and I think we generally do a pretty good job of covering the topics that we want. But, you know, there's always something that you could go into a little more detail on or clarify or, you know, just provide small explainers. And so one of the thoughts that I had was if uh, if the Patreons feel like it's a good idea, we could just choose a couple things here and there that we think uh, really need a little bit more explanation. We can put together some kind of shorts, audio shorts, and, and pass that out as, as we see fit. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And I think especially if... Uh, if people want to leave comments on Patreon and let us know specific topics that they want covered in more detail or they'd like an explainer on, I think that would be a um, definitely a useful thing that we could do. Sure. And I'm hoping at some point to get back into some of the uh, the art artistry part of what I was doing before. I had a couple immunology based comics that went up, which I enjoyed doing, but they do take some time. So we'll see if we can get uh, any sort of motivation to get that up and moving again yeah you only need to donate like fifty dollars per episode and then <laughs> uh, and then matt will be highly motivated if to get an, some comics if anyone out. donates ten dollars an episode i will provide you a personalized <laughs> comic of whatever episode you want uh, i like this i think yeah. we we could also provide some mm, immunology inspired music perhaps <laughs> oh, we did yeah discuss you and this, yes. could definitely uh like a verse make changed for, you know, use a favorite song of yours and make it about immunology, for example. We could that accomplish sounds like that. Fun. I like that. So anyway, yeah, we could have some fun with it. So if anybody has any great ideas, please. Definitely let us know at patreon.com slash immunity. And, and please do, you know, kick a little money our way. We do this for free. Um, we're not trying to get rich off of this um, off of this scheme. But it would be nice to not uh, not have to spend money in order to make it happen. So I have a really important point before we start. Yeah. I now have the name of my beer. Oh. Ah, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> it's called So Much for Subtlety, and it's the Lamp Lighter Brewing Company from Cambridge, Massachusetts. So it's oh, super nice. local. I don't think I've ever had anything from Lamp Lighter. It's pretty tasty. Is that a new brewery? I don't know. It be so the theme of my beers is going to be uh, interesting beers that people leave in my fridge after coming yeah. to visit. So this is number two in that department. Fantastic. Well, the first one wasn't actually a beer, right? It was a ginger. Well, ginger beer. It had yeah. beer it in was, the title. Okay. It was the original ginger beer, if I remember correctly. Y you do remember correctly. It's like good um, good and memory that for was beer. BS. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so, so now that we've gone through the like trying to get rich part of audio immunity um let's get into the paper so we we mentioned this briefly uh in the last episode um we're going to discuss a paper that was published in science uh earlier this year and it's called gut microbiome modulates response 
to anti-PD-1 immunotherapy in melanoma patients. And there are three first authors for this paper. Um, one of whom the first one, the first first author has a name that I'm definitely going to butcher, which is uh, Gopala Krishnan. That's um, actually not bad. Oh, I would thanks. I would have done worse there. Um, and then Spencer and Nezi are the first authors. And the last author is J.A. Wargo. Um, and so as with many scientific papers, the overall conclusions are sort of there in the title, although this one's a little bit wishy washy for my taste. Gut microbiome modulates response to anti-PD-1 immunotherapy. So we've discussed anti-PD-1 um, immunotherapy in melanoma patients on previous episodes. But in case we've got new listeners, or because it's been so damn long since we did this, uh, in case you forgot, the idea of anti-PD-1 immunotherapy, also sometimes called checkpoint blockade therapy, is that you are taking the brakes off of the immune system in people with cancer. So there's it used to be controversial, I think. Camilla, please correct me if I'm wrong, but it used to be sort of controversial whether or not the immune system actually did anything to protect against cancer. Oh, that's correct. And there was sort of like a back and forth, and some people said, yes, it definitely does. And the mechanism by which it would do this is that when you get cancer, the cells have some genomic instability. You might make new antigens that could be recognized as non-self by the immune system, uh, and they would destroy tumors. Um, I think there were some studies that showed like immunocompromised mice didn't have increased prevalence of cancer. So it was kind of like, well, maybe it's not that big a deal. But in the last several years, there's been a ton of work showing that there are a number of immune regulatory molecules that tend to suppress tumor environments. And one of them is this PD-1, PD-L1 axis where tumors uh, will often upregulate. I always forget which if the ligand or the receptor is the on which thing it's PD-1 is on the tumor, right? Uh, the T cells. The PD-1 is on the T cells. OK, so the tumors upregulate PD-L1, the ligand for PD-1 and T cells, when they get activated as part of the sort of normal uh, feedback response, will upregulate PD-L1. PD-1. 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 <laughs> T cells, PD-1, receptor, yes. Um, they'll upregulate it. And the idea is that as a T cell gets activated, it is starting to increase the negative feedback response. So when PDL1 binds to PD-1, there's a signal that's sent through PD-1 receptor that starts to deactivate the T cell response. And under normal circumstances, this is a good thing. You don't want runaway inflammation. But in the case of a tumor that is upregulating PDL1, uh Yes. I got ahead of my brain. No, but it's, um, that's, it's, that's bad. <laughs> right? That's bad. <laughs> that's bad. <laughs> right. So basically, uh, let me just back up a sec. But in the case of a tumor, they can upregulate this PDL1 to sort of damp down the immune response against the tumor that would be beneficial to the host. And so one of the sort of new revolutionary therapies for a number of intractable cancers that has come out in the past couple of years are these checkpoint blockade therapies, which will block the interaction between, for example, PD-1 and PD-L1. There's another uh, uh, regulatory molecule called CTLA-4 that's also been targeted. And by blocking this interaction, you can sort of take the brakes off of the immune response and allow the immune system to attack the tumors. And you may recall from a previous episode that we did on this, these therapies are sort of amazingly effective, or at least they can be, in a subset of patients to the point where people with like stage four metastatic melanoma, this is melanoma that is definitely going to kill them, some subset of patients are actually completely cured of melanoma or at least go into long term stable remission with treatment with these checkpoint blockades. That's yeah, it's, it's worth. Yeah, it's worth yeah. mentioning the sort of poster child of that was the Jimmy Carter case, right, where he had melanoma that had spread to his brain, essentially, which. You know, I, I know that I've used this phrasing even uh, on this podcast before, but no one in, in history has ever survived that. And he's still alive. Um, it was a pretty cool, pretty cool case study. Yeah, I think it, it was really interesting for me because being in tumor immunology, I started my PhD in 2011, I guess. And it was kind of at the same time as this big explosion of excitement over these types of therapies. So people went from kind of working against the immunology and cancer um, 
field saying, no, it really is important. The immune system really is important in cancer to everyone jumping on the bandwagon and being really inspired to, to actually change the outcome for these patients that had no previous options, really. So it's really a, an incredibly exciting time for tumor immunology. Now, can I ask a quick question about this, just backing up for a second? What is the natural uh, purpose for this PD-1, PD-L1 connection? Is this like protective against autoimmune states? Yeah, yeah. That, can I answer that? Am I qualified to answer that? I feel like maybe <laughs> maybe, maybe Cam- Camilla is a better uh, option. But um, so as Kevin, you know, started to allude to a little bit, uh, basically, Anytime you have an immune response, we have a tendency to think about the immune system turning on, ramping up, killing the bad guys, all of those sorts of things. Um, But there's an equally problematic part after the infection clears, and that is that your immune system is incredibly damaging. There's a lot of oxidative stress that goes on. Uh, You can create a really toxic microenvironment, and you can create that microenvironment which can lead to things, as you sort of mentioned, like autoimmunity or even other cancers, right? And so anytime you turn on a really robust adaptive immune response, especially if it's in a tissue that's particularly delicate, one of the important functions of the tissue itself is to sort of provide your immune system feedback and give it a sense that, um, you know, you're doing more harm than good at this point, right? So it's kind of a bit of an all clear signal where you've cleared the infection and the local tissue says, wait a minute, why don't we slow this inflammation down? You'll start to upregulate on that local tissue, the PDL one right? And the T cells use that signal to sort of know that they have to back off. And so this is a normal, you know, everyday function. Every time your immune system turns on, it then has to turn off. And this is just one of those normal signals that your immune system relies on in order to turn itself off. But one of the interesting things or one of the interesting perspectives that places on cancer immunology in particular is that these cells, presumably, that form the cancerous tumor do have the ability at some level to turn these signals on, right? So we're not talking about the expression of some like weird foreign protein that then shuts these T cells down. There's a good chance, for example, if it's a fibroblastic tumor, there's a good chance that those fibroblasts are pre-programmed in the case of an immune response to upregulate these signals under signs of stress. Yeah, and there are also other cells that can express PDL1 and then the other ligand PDL2. So it's one way that the tumors can shut off the T cells, but also other immune cells like macrophages are well known to express PDL1. And I think your your question is really on point and it's also where and where PD1 and PDL1 were discovered from the beginning was in autoimmunity because the knockout uh, for these um, um, for these molecules had autoimmune symptoms. And it's also what you see in patients when you give anti-PD1 and anti-PDL1 this side effects are uh, symptoms of autoimmune disease in patients who never had those kind of diseases before. Hmm. Okay, very cool. That's actually a, a maybe a nice transition into this paper, because as wonderful as these therapies are in terms of being able to treat previously incurable cancers, they do have a lot of pretty nasty side effects. Um, and so uh, in the previous paper that we talked about, we talked about how a lot of the patients in that study had to be taken off treatment because they had such severe gastrointestinal symptoms. They had increased inflammation in a lot of uh, different tissues. And this is because, again, we're taking the brakes off the immune system. And we're taking the brakes off the immune system in a sort of nonspecific way. We can't just lift the brakes on the anti-tumor T cells. We're also lifting the brakes on all of the other ones. And so the side effects for these drugs can be pretty nasty. And so one of the um, a major interest in studying these therapies uh, since they've come out has been to look for ways of potentially modulating the effects of these therapies by giving them in various combinations. So maybe you would give CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1. Maybe you would give some uh, anti-inflammatory drugs at the same time you're giving these pro-inflammatory drugs. So there's been a lot of interest in figuring out how to sort of dial up or dial down the different responses to these therapies. And so this paper is sort of taking some observations that were done in mouse experiments into human patients to see if those observations held up. And the observation is that 
the bacteria that live in the gut can actually affect how the immune system responds to these checkpoint blockade therapies. And so sort of going into this paper, which you can find on the website, by the way, if you want to get a link, there had been observations previously in mice showing that treatment with anti-PD-1 therapy could be affected by different states of the gut microbiome. So the responses were different in germ-free mice. Those are mice that have no microbiome. And by changing the bacterial composition of the gut, you could actually change the response to these immunotherapies and increase or decrease the effectiveness of the drug um, in a mouse model of metastatic melanoma. Yeah, there's actually a really cool paper that was published in Science in 2015 that, you know, it might just be my mouse bias, but I, I actually think it's a much cooler paper. Um, both are similarly impactful, I think, because you always have to show that this stuff works in humans. But there's some really cool findings in uh, this other science paper that was published a couple years earlier. So it might be worth putting a link up to that paper as well. And maybe I'll talk about it as we go through our discussion here. I, I also have it next to me as well. I also like that one a lot. So happy yeah, to talk it more. Was, it's really neat. It's really neat. Anyway. Yeah, it's it's always um, sort of a um, an interesting balancing act because my main criticism of this paper, of course, is that there's basically no way to get at mechanism. Right. Although um, they say mechanism. They say the word mechanism yeah. twice yeah. in the paper. <laughs> Let's talk but, about that. <laughs> but saying mechanism in a human study is very different than saying mechanism in a mouse study. Yes. Um, and Sh- sure we is. do we do have a bias um certainly in the in the immunology program um, that we were trained in. When I say we, I mean me, Matt, and Camilla all. Yes. Um, that we really like to get into the nitty gritty mechanisms. We want to have gene knockouts. We want to have various markers. And um, something I found as I have uh, started to delve more into human studies, looking at actually the microbiome in people, um, a lot of times that stuff just is not possible to do sure. in any meaningful way. They they sort of get at it in, in the last figure of the paper, which we'll get to, and we can talk about uh, what that says or doesn't say. But basically, to start out with this paper, they have a cohort of people that are all being treated, that all have metastatic melanoma, and are being treated with anti-PD-1 immunotherapy. Or they will be at the start of or the they study. Will be. They yeah, will that's right. perspective, right? Yeah, right. exactly right. So they're, they're taking... Um, fecal samples from these patients, analyzing the microbiome, and then looking after they've been treated with anti-PD-1, whether they respond or didn't respond, and then looking to see, can we see differences in the microbiomes of these patients um, when they responded or when they didn't respond? And one of the things that I found a little bit complicated or troubling in this paper is that they do a bunch of different things to look at the microbiomes in these patients. So they look at uh, 16S, they look at um, whole shock and metagenomic sequencing, and I'll sort of describe what the differences there are. They also look at both the oral microbiome and the stool microbiome, the gut microbiome, and they do a bunch of different statistical analyses. And sometimes it's a little bit tough to really nail down which which of the samples they're looking at and which which analyses were done uh, in the different figures. And so I'm going to try to disambiguate that as we go through. Um, but I may screw up. I also noticed disambiguate is a good word. Thank you. I like it. <laughs> looking for um, the word. <laughs> I also noticed as I was going through that they they give us the ends for a lot of these. In other words, the number of samples that they looked at. Yes. But like every single one is different. Yes, yes. I have the same. And that I, was very confusing. I don't yeah. really understand why so that is. Why is it 13 here and then 35 here and then, yeah. Yeah, some of that is explained by like the differences in 16S versus metagenomics. And some of it's explained by which patients they got oral samples from. But some of it just doesn't make any sense. I mean... Um, So I'm now working in a lab that basically relies on clinic samples coming through the door and it relies on people physically, you know, being there to receive them at all hours. And this paper in particular has a million and a half authors. And so what I'm wondering is if different people were responsible for different pieces of this. And at some point, the study got to a place where they said, well, we're going to get scooped and it's time to go with the data that we have. And so whatever the data were, right, they, I, I they got sure sort of sure that is the assembled. case. <laughs> I think you are almost certainly correct. I'm just confused because in some cases it seems like a different statistical analysis on the same data has different ends. 
Uh, I see. I see. Which maybe I'm misreading it because there's a lot of different things going on. But anyway, let's let's actually get into it. So first off, let's talk about the difference between 16S RNA and um, whole shotgun metagenomic sequencing or whole genome shotgun sequencing. So the difference here is that it's basically the level of resolution that you can get into the microbial constituents of some sample. So the 16S ribosomal RNA sequence is a gene that is present in all bacteria. It evolves very slowly, and it's usually only present in one form per bacterial species. And these three traits together make it a really good marker for the relatedness of bacteria. So if you can just sequence the 16S sequence for bacteria, you can get a good sense of who's there, basically, which microbial species are present in a given sample. And the way that you do this is that you use a PCR, the polymerase chain reaction, to amplify up all of the 16S uh, RNA sequences in a sample. So there are specific primers that you can use to do PCR on microbial samples. And there's some biases that are introduced in this, but this is a pretty common way of uh, looking at just microbial taxa. In other words, which species are present. And in particular, it can also be super useful in samples that are heavily polluted with human DNA. So for example, if you take a biopsy and you wanna see what microbes are associated with that biopsy, if you just look at all the DNA that's present, most of the DNA that you see is gonna be human DNA associated with human cells. And so if you use PCR to amplify up the 16S sequences, you can get um, just the microbial signal. But you lose a ton of information when you do 16S or RNA sequencing. Um, that you can recover if you do what's called metagenomic sequencing. So this is basically just uh, in an unbiased way, sequencing all of the DNA that's present in a sample. And this allows you to look not only at the taxonomy, so what bugs are there, but also what gene functions are present. Uh, and this can be really important because a lot of times the same exact microbial species with identical 16S sequences can have very, very different gene content. Unlike uh, humans or other animals, um, there's a ton of genetic variation, even at the species level in bacteria. So getting that sort of uh, whole genome shotgun sequencing uh, can provide a lot more information. Um, unfortunately, it's also much more expensive, so a lot of times labs won't do it. And because of the way that statistical tests work, if you have, like if you want to test for associations with every single gene that's present in a metagenomic sequence your statistical power to actually identify true positives goes way, way down. Um, so they actually got a whole shotgun sequencing only on a tiny subset of their stool samples. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about what they found there a little bit later. Um, in addition to the fecal 16S and metagenomic sequences, they also got, as I mentioned, oral microbiome samples. I think they only did 16S on those. They also got tumor biopsies that they use to do some uh, immunohistochemistry to look at uh, gene expression in human cells um, and do some immune profiling. And I think that is all of the samples. Am I missing anything? Yeah, no, I think you pretty much got it except for the uh, germ-free mice. Oh yeah, so that's gonna come later, but I'm just thinking about just the human, just human humans, samples for now. Yeah, I think that that's, I think that so, that's it. So these, um, uh, as we mentioned before, these samples were collected um, prospectively, in other words, before the start of immunotherapy. And then for some subset of the patients, they actually also got longitudinal microbiome sampling from after the, the treatment was finished. And so um, jumping into the figures now, if you go to figure one, basically this figure is just describing what they see. And um, as with a lot of microbiome studies, you see um, a lot of variation uh, between people. The microbiomes of any two individual people are likely to be quite different. Um, and so they need to look at some other way of sort of segregating uh, the different samples to see if there's an association with response or non-response to this immunotherapy. And so the first one they looked at um, is something called the alpha diversity. So alpha diversity is basically within sample diversity. 
how many different species do I have in my gut microbiome compared to you? And to do this, they use a measure called the um, Simpson correlation. This is just a measure of diversity. So a higher number means you have more diversity in uh, your fecal microbiome. And they see a moderate but supposedly statistically significant difference between the responders and the non-responders in that responders have more alpha diversity than the non-responders do. Right. And it might be worth uh, just pointing out what the definition of responder versus non-responder here is, right? Because they do make the point that in their non-responder population, basically what they're looking for is they're looking for improvement for six months, right? There's a six month cut off to this. And so if your treatment has to progress in those six months or you have to get pulled off, then you are considered a non-responder. But they do mention in the paper that uh, other studies have shown that even the people that are classified as non-responders in this study, they may have long-term disease improvement, but it just might not be caught in the sort of strict parameters that they're looking in. So, Right. Excellent point. So uh, another thing that they do is they um, sort of separate out these people into um, sort of doing the, the reverse uh, thing. So rather than saying we know who responded and who didn't respond and what is their alpha diversity like, um, they took everyone and separated them into three groups, uh, basically three tertiles. So the high diversity, intermediate diversity and low diversity subjects, and then compared those three groups to say who did better. And as you might expect, there is significantly higher survival in the subjects that have high diversity microbiomes. Um, compared to people who have intermediate or low diversity microbiomes. And again, this is just sort of within this cohort comparison. Right. And this is true in other studies as well, right? Absolutely. It's, uh, in, there are a number of disease states where sort of a thinning of your microbiome diversity is a pretty good indicator that things have gone pretty wrong. Yeah. Right. And I think that that happens in autoimmunity. Correct me if I'm wrong as it well. It does. It happens um, particularly in um, IBD and a number of other sort of gut disorders. But yeah, in general, uh, low diversity microbiome is bad. Um, but it doesn't. One thing that's always a little bit problematic about these things is it's it's really unclear whether disease states lead to low diversity or if low diversity is the cause of disease states. And I think um, there's sort of a mix of those things. So uh, oftentimes the causal arrow can sort of go in both directions and it's sometimes hard to uh, separate um, the, the causal nature of this. So in this example, it could be that people who are more sick have lower diversity microbiomes and people who are more sick also don't respond as well. And so we're seeing um, sort of two two different results of the same state, basically. Yeah. It's probably worth coming back to that point at the end of all of this when we kind of get to the conclusions and what we've learned, because there are a number of studies like this that, like you said, I mean, you can't you can't get into human mechanism in the way that you can with mice. But it's always important, I think, at the end of finding all of these correlations to sort of take a step back and figure out what we have really learned that's new. So maybe right. we can come back to that point at the end of this paper. Sure. Yeah. And I think here was one of the points, um, or at least in the first figure and uh, stratifying the patients from high, intermediate, low diversity. I think this was one of the cases where I was wondering about the N, because here we have 13 patients per group. And I was a little unclear. It was unclear to me as to why there were 13 per group in this particular example. And maybe it's because, like you said, there were only, you know, only 36 patients available to divide this way, or they stratified patients in a way that was described in the methods. And maybe... I need to go into more detail there. But here is one of the cases where I was wondering why the number of dots were not the same across the panels. Yeah, definitely. They they said they got uh, 16S RNA sequencing on all of their gut samples, which was... Uh, 53? I think 89. Oh, 89. Total samples, right? 54 is the um, number of responders. Because it also says in the figure legend, like fecal samples and 53. But I also saw... 89 somewhere. So maybe... Yeah, 89 was the total, responders and non-responders together. Right. I think. Huh. Um, they have 112 oral and gut microbiome samples. 
Um, they don't say how many are which. Yeah, it's very confusing. I, I tried to like I tried to run it down and could not actually figure out what samples were going into which analyses, which bugs me a lot. But um, anyway, so another thing that they do, which is pretty standard in uh, microbiome studies, is that they do a principal coordinate analysis. And I think I tried to describe this on an episode a long time ago. Yeah, it's um, magic. And that was before I had studied uh, <laughs> what we microbiomes. decided was it's magic. It it is. I, I would love an explanation magic. as a non-immunologist because I have no idea what's going on in well, this, panel. This, this isn't is an magic. immunology this thing. Is this, not is not a, this is Harry Potter. I mean, yeah. <laughs> this Whatever is a microbiome this is, thing. I so, didn't get it. <laughs> okay, I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> so I'm going to attempt to describe it now because I think I have a better understanding of it now than I did the last time I tried to describe it on the podcast. So I'm going to try again. So there are different ways of determining the distance between samples. Okay, so um, in ecology, there have been a number of things that have been developed to say, like, how how dissimilar is one sample from another sample? So um, one is the the Bray Curtis index, which is let's say you go into a forest and you're at site A and you count 10 of one species of species A, you count 20 of species B and you count 180 of species C. And at the other site, you count um, I probably should have written these numbers down so I don't repeat myself, but uh, some other number of each of these species. <laughs> if, if, for example, there are a lot more of species A in the second site and much fewer of species B and C, those two sites might seem very distant. Whereas if the numbers are more or less equivalent or they have the same relative abundance, so maybe you have more in absolute terms, but the sort of ratios of A to B to C are the same, then those are going to be similar sites, right? So the dissimilarity is lower. And there is an equation that you can use to to measure the dissimilarity. Um, in this case, they don't use Bray-Curtis. They use something called the unifract distance, but we don't have to go into that. But basically, it's just a measure, a way of saying these two samples where we have hundreds of different microbes, we have a bunch of different features, we're going to narrow down the distance between those two samples to a single number. You guys with me so far? Yes. Yes. Okay, so low numbers are very similar samples. They have a low dissimilarity. High numbers are very dissimilar. So if if two samples are identical, they have a dis- dissimilarity of zero, and if they are they have nothing in common, they have a dissimilarity of one. So what principal coordinate analysis does is it takes these sort of pairwise distances between tens or hundreds of samples. And then this is the part where it's going to get confusing. It um, uses fancy linear algebra to build a multidimensional space where the distances between each dot correspond to the dissimilarity that they have. The, The problem is, is that it takes more than two dimensions in order to represent all of these distances correctly or accurately. So you actually have some multi-dimensional space that is somewhat hard to visualize, but we can take the, the first two axes of variation and we can also calculate how much of the variation is explained by those two axes and sort of plot a 2D plot that shows um, that shows the dissimilarity between samples. And so if you look at figure 1F, you see axis 1 explains 50% of the variance and axis 2 explains 16% of the variance. So in this plot, dots that are further apart are more dissimilar than dots that are close together. And altogether, what we're seeing here is about 60 to 70% of the total variation between these samples. So, okay, based on that, and my understanding has gone from zero to very weak. <laughs> Uh, we've got two populations here. We've got a whole whole bunch of points that are being measured against each other in two-dimensional space, which is flattened from multidimensional space. And well, we're we're looking. It's right. not that it's flat. Well, it's not we're just flattened. looking we're at, two, of looking the at two dimensions. We're yep. the most important two dimensions, presumably. Right. right. So, what of what importance at all 
does the centroid then give us? Um, here's why I ask. Yep. If I look at these dots and I pulled all of the lines away and I got rid of the centroids, yep. how many populations would I see? If you got rid of the colors. Yep. If you got well, rid of the colors and you looked at just the distributions of these dots in relation to each other, how many populations would you see? Yeah, you'd probably see more than what they're showing. I'd see three. Right. I'd see somewhere around the negative two and a half or negative point two five on the X, somewhere around zero, you know, negative point one on the Y. I should also say, by the way, that the the numbers on the axis are completely I meaningless. Yeah, I, I, yeah, exactly. And then in the upper right quadrant, there's definitely a clustering, and that's where you get either responders or non-responders. And then in the lower right quadrant, it seems like you have a couple outliers that are clear non-responders, right? Right. I agree so with that. I, yes. It seems to me like this data would suggest that you've got a population of clear responders, a population of clear non-responders, and then a giant mess that probably sits somewhere in the middle. Yes. They sort and, of see later on. Yes. Right. And, they do. And so I guess my question again is why are the centroids important in this plot? It seems like they're misleading, if anything. Um, yes and no, because for for every person, there is going to be some variation around uh, a mean. So if you took the exact same individual that was going to be a responder or a non-responder and you sampled them on a different day, there's going to be some movement in this multidimensional space. And for some people, there's not much movement. And for some people, there's a ton of movement. And so unfortunately, we don't have launched many longitudinal samples for these subjects. But I will say that this I don't normally see centroids plotted, but this behavior where you have some clear distinction, but a lot of overlap is not at all uncommon in these sorts of studies. With yeah, humans. I, it just seems to me like you have a better subset, right, than your responders, non-responders. And I would have. I, I am interested in if you pulled those uh, clear cut patients out, what you would see. I would have liked to have seen some sort of analysis done on a grouping that was a little bit more clear. Do you see what I'm saying? I do. But anyway, um, I mean, it's totally fine to do it the way that they did, but it piqued my interest because I feel like there's, you know, 10 patients, 13 patients here that are telling us something interesting. And I wish that I knew more about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Agreed. I mean, unfortunately, you can't you can't really separate out those patients from the rest of the group, like it, in a statistically rigorous way. OK, right? like you, you can't um, you can't subset based on the dissimilarity because then you are going to skew your results. So unfortunately, you just have to throw everything together. And when you throw everything together, you often get very mess messy pictures. But wouldn't you say, though, once you have that picture, you can say, well, we're going to look at these these patients that ended up in this cluster and these other patients that ended up over here, right? That's usually with immune cells, when you profile them, you would get these different clusters that you then can assess afterwards. Yeah, but uh, Why that's, can't sort I? Of what, that's sort of what they're doing later. Um, I want to draw a circle around these 10 people right now. <laughs> And I want to dump and I want to double click on that circle. And then I want to do another principal component analysis. Give me Flojo of principal component analyses, Kevin. <laughs> I have I have often thought about that. Um, and I think that it would be meaningless. OK, <laughs> to do that, because once you once you take out um, like if you remove a single point or you add a single new point in, it changes the entire PCOA. Oh, no, I totally understand that. But once we've got this data, I want to know what those 10 outliers were. I want to see if there's something interesting about them. And and then I don't have to think about this plot ever again. I don't want to ever think about this plot after I pull those 10 patients out. That's fair. And you can do that. Um, and you can also do things like you can map certain species abundance onto the, the PCOA to see if uh, for example, one one species or one family sort of is explained by one of the axes of variation, um, which is often the case. Um, but yeah, honestly, this this is fairly low N anyway. So um, OK, so enough about this lie that is from magic. Yes. Um, <laughs> so let's get on to some other lies from magic. So the next thing that they do is they sort of do a somewhat related analysis, but now they're going to sort of look at all of um, not just the sort of uh, diversity as a single number, um, not just the most abundant taxa, but now they're going to look at all of the what are called operational taxonomic units or OTUs. And this is just a sort of fancy way of saying um, we can't actually resolve species 
using 16s. So we just define two species as being different if their 16s sequences are some percentage different. Usually it's like 97%. And we'll define that as a taxonomic unit and um, just give it a label. Um, and you could map these onto um, reference databases to know exactly what that species is, but um, it's not super necessary for this analysis. And then they they use um, hierarchical clustering to segregate the responders and the non-responders to look if there are particular taxa that are um, more prevalent in one group rather than the other. And they find sort of three groups of OTUs, one group that is enriched in responders, one group that is enriched in non-responders, and then a bunch that are sort of similarly distributed across responders and non-responders. And they go into what these species are. Uh, I don't know that going through the actual uh, taxa names is super interesting. Um, they also do a number of different uh, statistical analyses one of them is called LEFC, one of them is called linear discriminant analysis. Um, to be honest, I don't know nearly as much about the statistics for these guys, and um, basically they all show more or less the same thing, which is that um, certain taxa, particularly in uh, the Bacteroidales uh, family, tend to be associated with non-responders, and a number of Clostridia species are associated with uh, the responders. As, as someone who knows more about sort of the human microbiome, when you look at these different taxa, are you surprised that the one, like some are enriched versus others? Or are these, you know, are these expected changes that you would see? Or is it, does it more appear random? The bugs that they, that pop up are quite familiar. They pop up in a lot of things. They so one example, so Fecalibacterium is one thing that they show is differentially abundant. Um, and Fecalibacterium is one of the most prevalent species or g genera in the human microbiome. And it is often associated with wide changes in um, in the microbiome because it is extremely oxygen sensitive. And so if you if you have disruptions in the gut microbiome, it's normally an anaerobic environment, but if you have inflammation or if you have weird things going on, oftentimes it's very sensitive to that. Hmm. And there are other bacteria, particularly the Bacteroidales, that, that are sort of um, less oxygen sensitive and um, often go up sort of in, in contrast to that. But so, I did want to point out that I thought I thought it was actually pretty interesting that the Clostridialis was what was associated with the responders, because when we think of the Clostridialis family, we're thinking of a number of known, quote unquote, bad actors, right? Like C. difficile, which causes colitis, uh, tetanus, botulism, all of these are, are known causes of inflammation and inflammatory response. So to my non-immunologist mind, I sort of thought that there was an obvious tie-in there to a better response to therapy, that these are sort of already responsible for triggering higher levels of inflammation in the body. Yes, I had the exact same response when I first started looking into this, but there are actually a lot of Clostridialis species that are not associated with disease and are actually associated with healthy states. Oh, really? Um, so you are correct. There are a lot of pathogens in that group, but there are also a lot of um, sort of good guys. Um, I think okay. uh, Fecalibacterium is a clust Clostridium species, right? Mm, it is not grouped with those in the in D. Well, Fecalibacterium is a genus, so um, right. But where anyway, it's will, being listed separate. <laughs> yeah, it's being listed separately. But anyway, it, it's. Apparently they ferment dairy fibers, Kevin. Mm -hmm. I thought you'd find that fascinating since you're into fermentation. I do. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> okay, and so the, then they go on to do sort of a similar thing with the metagenomic sequences. They have far fewer subjects where they have this, but again, you get higher resolution. Doesn't really tell us much. Also, just side note, I was really annoyed that they're constantly switching color schemes. <laughs> um, mm, yeah, they that was they tend to be consistent for the responder and non responder. But like high, medium, low, they keep switching up like what the gradient is. Um, it's very frustrating. Anyway, that's not a period over there. <laughs> um, so, so at the end of figure two, we're at this point where we say, okay, we know there are differences between the gut microbiomes of people who tend to respond and to people who don't. And figure three is sort of more or less the same. Um, they, again, they do, they separate. Um, in this case, they they cluster the OTUs based on which OTUs tend to be associated with each other. 
and they they see some difference where one clade one so basically this is a way of showing like different communities you might say or different like sets of microbes and they see two pretty distinct uh, groups I don't know how much I buy this analysis. They do show that one is enriched for Fecalibacterium and one is enriched for Bacteroidetes, or Bacteroidales, rather. Um, and then they show that there are different uh, functional components in those two groups. Again, this is using the metagenomic data. So here we can dig into uh, what genes are present, and you can use um, sort of annotations about what gene functions have, um, and they find that there's some enrichment for biosynthesis um, in the group that contains uh, non-responders. Again, I'm, first of all, I'm really annoyed that they again changed the color scheme to yellow and blue here in this heat map. Uh, but <laughs> uh, this this sort of analysis, again, it's commonly done. I don't think it gives us a ton of biological insight um, in terms of like, they, they reference a couple of papers where they previous studies have shown that biosynthesis tends to be associated with uh, more inflammatory states, I think. Um, but there's not like a, a direct line between some gene function and uh, response or non-response to PD-1 therapy. Yeah. Um, let me throw this at you quick. I'm just going to read two sentences from the actual text. Next, we sought to gain insight into the mechanism through which the gut microbiome might influence response to anti-PD-1 therapy and first conducted functional genomic sequencing or functional genomic profiling, you know, dot, dot, dot. And then the last sentence of that paragraph. Comparisons of pathway enrichment across these groups showed changes in metabolic functions with anabolic functions predominating in responders, including amino acid biosynthesis, which may promote host immunity reference, whereas catabolic functions predominated in non-responders. And that is it. That's what we get. So, yeah. uh, and, you know, this is to get back a little bit to the point that you brought up earlier. And I agree that we are a little biased into the mechanism. And I think part of the problem is that reviewers demand mechanism, right? You can do mm -hmm. a lot of elegant science and then throw it to a reviewer and they say, well, we don't know how it works. And so you must have a mechanism and you can, you know, stand there with patient samples all day. You can't really get at it. But you know, a line that says it may promote host immunity, <laughs> referring out <laughs> to some study that's not yours is not a mechanism. And so I, I that it, it the way it's that, not that a was, it's not a mechanism, but it is mechanistic insight. Is it? <laughs> what, what, no, I don't know what that means. What, what, yeah, but what, what have we gathered from this? And, it's and this is something it's suggestive of biological changes happening in these samples, but it, it will not tell you causality and causality is what mechanism is. Right. But what is it even suggestive of? If I if I were to ask the author, you know, what what is the metabolic change here suggesting? Right. What species are we talking about? What like it, I I really gain absolutely no insight from this kind of pathway analysis. And this is something I think that metabolic studies have a tendency to run away with and have ran away with because the technology has gone on so quickly. But like describing a metabolic pathway, I think, is not inherently valuable to me as a reader. Yes, I agree with that. But I will also say that when before Wendy Garrett and colleagues published that short chain fatty acids mm. have this like super strong effect on T regulatory cells, you might have seen some metabolic pathway that was associated with the production of short chain fatty acids and been like, I see that there is a super strong correlation here between autoimmune disease and lack of short chain fatty acid biosynthesis. I have no idea why that would be a mechanism. Right. And, but amino and acid and biosynthesis comes out of every single one of these studies. Yes. Like any time the immune system turns on or off, this changes. Yes. Right. Anytime a DC has to reprogram itself and go and migrate somewhere, it necessarily must change its metabolism. Yeah. Right? But here, and, here and we're telling looking at me, the metabolism of the microbiome, not of the immune cells. Right. Which is composed of 14,000 different species. Yes. Right. Like I, I just 
uh, I don't know. I'm I, being a curmudgeon. I think I'm somewhere somewhere <laughs> between Matt and Kevin on this point. I agree with the the vagueness of uh, of the pathway analysis in general. It can really be non informative sometimes, but it also gives you some some idea of if there are broader themes rather than looking at individual genes. And sometimes it can really be helpful to tell you, okay, something is going on in this general area. Right. But I guess if it's more specific I, I, than than I, amino I, acids I, biosynthesis. Yes. Right. I agree with you. I, I just worry that the generalities here point to something that is really just reflective of like literally any kind of biological change. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. I think that's true. And actually, Camilla, I, I, I think that the distance I am from Matt is not as uh, large as <laughs> you might think it is. I'm um, squeezed in between I'm you guys, okay? Playing... I'm like squeezed right in there. <laughs> I'm mostly just trying to play devil's advocate here. Um, <laughs> mostly because... It, while I agree that this is uh, somewhat problematic, um, it's also very, very common. It is unfortunately the best we can do. And this yes. is a science paper. Yeah, so that's like, true. Yep, I, you're absolutely right. I think yep. one of the things I have struggled with the most is the number of ends in these Kaplan-Meier curves. Because I I know I'm under the impression that you need quite a few patients to to actually see something here and be convinced of the statistical um, significance. So I would I would have liked to see a little more, a higher number of patients in, in the two groups separating them. That being said, I do recognize that it's, it's challenging to get patients. And, you know, this is really a, a huge effort that they've put together for this paper. But sure. I agree with all of that. And I will say that, that I think figures one through three are sort of like, yeah, okay, kind of interesting. Um, figure five, I think, is where the actual like meat is put on this paper. And I sort of mentioned like they have tumor biopsies, they do some immune profiling. This is autoimmunity, so maybe we should spend more time with it. But I want to jump straight to figures uh, G through the end um, where they do a... There's um, mice again. There's mice. <laughs> and they do the sort of um, gut microbiome equivalent of adoptive transfer experiments where they take um, the uh, feces from... They take the stool samples from responders and non-responders and then they uh, put them into germ-free mice. And then they use a mouse model of melanoma, treat them with anti-PD-1 therapy, and see what the response is. And it turns out that the microbiomes from responders, or maybe it's from a responder, I don't know how many times they did this, but actually Twice, I think. decreased the, the size of the tumor pretty substantially in uh, the mice that got the stool from the, the responder um, and also had a larger immune response uh, measured by CD8 infiltration into the tumor. So this this is getting at a uh, mechanism in a sort sort of getting a mechanism. We don't know why. <laughs> See, I would, but I would argue it's that getting we're just... A causality, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it it's is. getting a causality, at least. It's getting a causality. We... This demonstrates that the causal arrow points from the microbiome directly to response to PD-1. And, you know, this this shouldn't be surprising, actually, because we know that the microbiome has profound impacts on the immune system. And actually, germ-free mice, they have really, really messed up immune systems. Giving them basically any microbe improves it. But there are differences between the microbiomes from the responders and the non-responders. And the responders' microbiomes make these mice more responsive to anti-PD-1 therapy. So can we, so, can uh, we unpack so, that a little bit? Because I, yeah. think, I think I agree that the tumor grows differently in these different mice. So when you get fecal, a fecal transplant from responders, the tumor appears smaller on day 14, right? That they show an age. Yeah. But we also know, and this I know from lab, but also from other studies, is that when you give anti PD1 to a smaller tumor or anti PDL1, which is, I haven't worked with anti PDL1, but if you give anti PD1 to a mouse that has a smaller tumor, it tends to work a lot better. And there's kind of a critical threshold that when you give, when you block this, this pathway too late, it doesn't really have an effect in some models. And so in this case, is the difference that we're seeing that the tumor is already smaller to begin with when they start treatment or that they are actually more or less sensitive to anti one I'm not sure. I think it's still intriguing, but I'm not sure based on these data. 
Yeah, I, That's I guess I'm not convinced that this has really anything to do with anti pdl one at all, right? So it's it's been previously published that uh, by changing the microbiome of a mouse, so uh, there's another paper that this paper references that was published in 2015 that suggests that if you just take Jackson mice and taconic mice and you inject B16 melanoma into it, the microbiome differences between those two strains is sufficient to get a really different tumor growth rate, right? And you can actually go in and alter the microbiome of those mice at any time during the tumor growth, and it changes the tumor progression, right? And that's basically what they're seeing in these in these patients' microbiomes is that they're altering these germ-free mice in a way that these mice are less permissive at baseline to the tumor growth. And that's before they get anywhere near anti pdl one therapy. And so to, to then stack the anti pdl one therapy on top of that and say, you know, well, look, the microbiome is really having an effect here. It almost feels to me like what you're doing is you're just changing the general interplay between the immune system and the microbiome. And then, you know, because you've altered that, now the PDL1 therapy is going to, to work slightly better, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be specific to the therapy anymore. Yeah, I agree with you. And I. It's a really good point. And I think you, one of the. And actually, the, the paper that you referenced, the Gajewski paper, it was funny because this also happened in lab to us, but we never published on it because we didn't you know, go through down this route. But we had a Nokia model, which was from Taconic, and we ordered the mice and we put in the tumors the same way that we always did. And when we sacked the mice, they just had much smaller tumors than we expected based on what we would see in the wild type mice from Jax. And we were really, you know, we said maybe there's some genetic difference or maybe the microbiota, we don't have time, we're doing other things. Um, but then Gajewski published the paper and we said, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, we agree with that. <laughs> it's really quite <laughs> different. So if we put the mice together and made them eat their, you know, co-house them like they did, maybe we would have seen, that di- we wouldn't have seen that difference. So, yeah. I don't know. I, I still think it's interesting. Like, I think the paper's interesting. And I think it's always important to go back into humans and say, yeah, actually, the microbiome in humans under, under normal circumstances is having an effect on the way that these treatments are functioning. I just I clearly bristle a little bit at, at some of the uh, the mechanistic insights, but that's probably a personal problem. No, I think it's totally fair. And I think it's a um it is a an ongoing problem in microbiome research and and part of the issue is again we have we're looking at so many features and the interperson variation just among healthy people is so high that separating signal from noise is really really hard and so this is sort of state of the art for yeah. microbiome work yeah. at the moment um, sure and sure we're we're trying to make it better i'm in a lab that's trying to make it better so think, make it better <laughs> that's cool that's very cool <laughs> i think i think one of the things that the paper adds to the discussion is you know there are all these different factors that we have to consider because like you said in the beginning kevin people are really trying to figure out you know what makes some patients respond to ntp1 and one make you know and why do some patients not respond and so far, people have come up with, well, how many T-cells they have in the tumor seems to matter. The mutational load, just like you mentioned. And now there seems to be also this component of the microbiome. And probably all these things are related together. And we're, you know, people are really trying to figure out, what is there a way that we can easily tell when a patient walks into the clinic, you're going to respond and you're not going to respond. And so we should put you on this other treatment, you know, and that will make you respond and vice versa. And, it, and this literature really comes from a... a kind of a tradition of figuring out, you know, what makes these different anti-cancer treatments tick. And uh, the papers leading up to it were looking at other kinds of anti-cancer therapy and studying, you know, where the, the, both the immune response is relevant, but also the microbiota. So it kind of folds into the same category of things. And now we have to consider, okay, the microbiome also seems important. Exactly how and exactly if it's causal or not, it's not clear, but this is one other component that comes into it. And that's what I really liked about this paper. You know, I took sort of the 10,000 overview approach and I said, okay, so, you know, do we envision now that maybe we would do things like fecal transplants or probiotics or dietary changes, things like that, uh, in concert with these anti-PD-1 and other checkpoint uh, blockade uh, therapies? And as it turns out, that is exactly what's up next for this group. Uh, So it seems now they're working with the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy to develop a clinical 
clinical trial that will combine checkpoint blockade with the microbiome modulation, which is pretty cool, right? It's the next step. Super cool. I like it. Yeah. And and I will say that I know for a fact that there are just in Cambridge, there are like four or five startup companies that are trying to develop microbiome based therapies for various things. But I'm sure that tumor immunity is among them. So, um, yeah, this is a a hot topic at the moment, um, and I'm sure it will come up again because. Well, because I'm in a lab that studies the microbiome now, and uh, I think interactions with the microbiome and the immune system are super cool. Um, but uh, I think now, now that we have thoroughly bashed this paper, we should move on to um, a couple of listener questions that we got uh, specifically about tumor immunity. So, Chadine, you said you had one from Facebook, right? Yes. Yes, I do. So a former mentor of mine who was at BU... Uh, Dr. Barb Nikolajic. Uh, She's now an associate professor of pharmacology and nutritional sciences at University of Kentucky. Uh, And she specifically was wondering if somebody wanted to discuss, and this is this is a big one, how inflammation can fuel cancer, yet inflammation is also necessary to clear the cancer. Right. And I think we touched on it a little bit towards the beginning. This could go on for a while. So if we want to save this one, I'm sure she won't might be a whole episode on its own. Um, Like an immunology 101 thing. Yeah. Kevin, Kevin, I think you're in probably a pretty good position to answer it, though, with your macrophage background. Yeah. So. So there are a couple pieces to that. So so one is that inflammation is not necessarily necessary to clear a tumor. There are a number of mechanisms that are in place to prevent tumors from getting going. Um, a lot of them are genetic. We have, uh, you know, um, tumor suppressor genes, a whole bunch of different mechanisms that try to prevent cancers from taking hold. One of those mechanisms is uh, the immune system. But the immune system is sort of um, poorly positioned in general to attack cancer cells because the immune system should not attack itself, um, should not attack self, and tumors are at baseline self. And so, you know, unless tumors are forming these neoantigens, there's no way for the immune system to see it. In terms of how the immune system can cause cancer, um, there are a couple of different ways. So, um, there's there's the sort of like etiology question, and then there's the facilitation question. So um, inflammation, as Matt said earlier, is quite damaging to tissues. You have the production of uh, free radicals, uh, reactive oxygen species, and all of these things can lead to DNA damage in particular. And DNA damage uh, mutagens, as most people probably know, are one of the major sources of cancer. You get mutations in those tumor suppressor genes that knock them out. You get uh, activation of oncogenes. And so that, I think, is one of the principal ways the immune system and inflammation can increase risk of cancer. But then there's also the fact that tumors can often be devious and um, manipulate cells of the immune system, like macrophages, to sort of restructure the uh, tissue environment to be much more... um, advantageous for tumor growth. So um, you can get uh, tissue remodeling from macrophages. Um, You can also get uh, other cells to be activated to increase uh, blood circulation, uh, promote neoangiogenesis, et cetera, et cetera. I think that, does that cover it? I think so. My head is in a fog. Yeah. (laughs) That sounded pretty good to me. I don't even remember anything I (laughs) I, just said. I think, well, so, and and you touched on the macrophage, the innate side of things, you know, really contributing to the generation, we think, of some of these cancers. And on the other side, um, whether you think about it as inflammation or not, I mean, this whole paper focused around this idea that the adaptive immune system, the B cells, the T cells that are coming in and specifically targeting the cancer are the ones that are going to be sort of cleaning it up. So one thing that I would say is you're you're talking about uh, potentially different cell types that are going to be causing versus trying to mop up the mess after the fact. And I think here it's it's really dynamic and so interesting right now because we honestly as a as a person in the myeloid tumor immunology field, there are so many things we don't know because in some contexts dendritic cells seem really important in triggering the the anti-tumor T-cell responses. In some cases, some DCs seem to not be helpful. In many cases, macrophages seem bad for the the host, but sometimes they can actually be a bit good. Actually, the original idea was that macrophages killed tumor cells directly. And so it's it's a constantly evolving mystery. And I think with the the ability to use single cell um, 
RNA-seq, for example, as one of the ways to really tease apart what all of the individual cells are doing at different time points in a, in a cancer, and even maybe before the cancer starts, you know, we, we will start to uncover how these things you know, initiate the tumor, how they change during tumor progression, and how they respond to therapy. And I think it's a, I, I do want to touch on that a little bit in the paper because they do some immune cell profiling. And I think they do some blanket statements in here um, that deserve some, uh, some discussion. I don't know if you guys picked up on that. What did you think? Well, why don't you go ahead and, and <clears throat> tell okay. us what you specifically <laughs> objected to? And So they were talking about the enrich on the last page. They do some immune cell profiling and they talk about um, innate effector cells, which they define as CD45 positive, C11B positive, positive, Li6G positive cells. And this is typically how you would define neutrophils in a tumor. But of course, this can be dynamic. And they call them innate effector cells. And then they talk about suppressive myeloid cells, which are C11B positive, C11C positive. And C11C is usually used to define dendritic cells, Also, although this is very broad. And I think it's not really possible to just define dendritic cells this, this way anymore. And, it is not. Right. And actually, yeah, I won't go there. But... <laughs> But you could also consider... I have ranted before about yes. PDCs yes. on this podcast. Just so you know. <laughs> We've definitely... Okay, I'll stop there. So the uh, the Lysic-G positive cells could also be described as suppressive myeloid cells, or the conversely, the C11B positive C11C cells could also be innate effector cells. So these are kind of terms that ascribe to these cells that I haven't seen before in this way. And I was a bit surprised. And they don't really explain what they do functionally. And again, it's a human study. It's hard to know. Um, but I will say that it's not as clear as this paper makes it out to be that, that the Lysix-G cells would be bad towards the tumor or good towards the tumor. It's, it's a bit unclear at this point. I think that's fair. I, I think that there's a decent chance that it could just be that this is what worked. And so yep. that's yeah. what they're showing no, us. That's totally fair. All right. Um, hopefully that answered uh, your question. I forget your name already. Barb. Um, <laughs> thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm really sick, guys. I'm like really, really sick. Such a trooper, Kevin. Such a trooper. Don't know if that came across. So I do want to just highlight a question from my dad who posted on Facebook. Um, I don't think he's actually going to listen to the podcast, but I thought we should read it anyway. He said that um, the other day on NPR, I heard that several patients with rare forms of cancer got a single infusion of modified T cells from their own bodies that cost 300000 to 500000 <laughs> which the drug companies were paying for we the go. trials. Yep. Do you foresee in the next five years there could be some such breakthroughs for certain cancers that would cost less than $50,000? So I think I think this is referring to the CAR T cell. Yeah, um, that sounds thing. right. And yeah. um, you know, ideally, these these therapies are going to get cheaper. But also, I think that uh, stuff like checkpoint blockade are probably um, more promising from a cost effectiveness standpoint than taking cells out and genetically modifying them. Although uh, gene editing technology being what it is um, and advancing at the speed that it is, maybe that will come down in cost. And also there may be uh, tumors that just are not addressable through things like checkpoint blockade. And so um, for really intractable tumors, um, we may just have to eat the cost um, or let people die. So um yikes um also so so if we get into the, you're getting into a bit of a um political and capital question too here i mean how much for example uh camilla how much would it take to pull a mouse get t-cells out modify them genetically edit them and put them back what would you, if you were to just ballpark that in your lab? Oh, that's a good question. Not, not so much. Not, not, not several not, hundred thousands of dollars. That's not for sure. 300. Now there's going to be a lot of QC. There's going to be a lot of development cost. A, a good not example of this liability. right now. So a lot of um, the biologics out there, the PD-1, pd one blockade stuff, uh, CTLA-4 stuff. I mean, you're, you're talking about bulk produced antibody. It's not so hard to produce antibodies. It is hard to get it past the FDA. It's hard to develop the technology. It's hard to do all of those things. Right now, we are paying an enormous price for these biologics. And the companies that are making them are being extremely well compensated for the product that they're giving. And so part of that question, unfortunately, also is at what point um, 
do the profit margins start to tighten on selling those drugs, unfortunately? I am definitely confident that our current Congress is up to the challenge of regulating <laughs> biologics. Oh, boy. <laughs> and yeah. with that, I think I should say that this has been uh, Audio Immunity. And um, we have a couple of things that we would like you, dear listener, to do. Um, one of them we already mentioned. Go to patreon.com slash audioimmunity and um, kick us a few cents per episode. It would be really great. Even if you're going to just give us a dime just so that we know you're out there. We have several hundred people subscribed to our RSS feed and so far only four people that are donating. So if you are one of those lurkers, um, just let us know you're there. Give us a penny. Give us a nickel. No, <laughs> give us ten dollars. <laughs> Since we asked for your money, we have not actually produced an episode until this one right now. So please feel like this this is your opportunity <laughs> to uh, to see that we're really going to do this. Yeah, and and this we're recording two weeks since the last recording we yeah, did. Yeah, no, we're doing well so far. Uh, I got the episode edited in less than a week and posted the last yeah. time, so I'm feeling good about this. I feel great. Um, you can also go to facebook.com slash audioimmunity and leave us comments, leave us questions, let us know what you think we should discuss. Um, we've got a form on our website, immunity.org slash uh, contact where you can leave us a paper that you want us to discuss or a comment or um, tell us what Matt mispronounced this episode. Um, <laughs> please be in touch. Let us know you're out there um, and what you think we should be doing. If you think we should be doing anything differently. Um, give us suggestions for rewards for our Patreon donors. Um, we are happy to entertain any and all suggestions. Um, Can I do a uh, shameless plug, Kevin, before you're done? You should absolutely do a shameless plug. So my shameless plug will be that on Friday, so December 1st, um, my first author paper for, from my PhD thesis will be published in Science. And if you are excited woo, woo. <laughs> about more tumor immunology, this is the place to go. It will be more about neutrophils in the tumor and actually a little bit about the bone marrow and bone and how bone forming cells may be involved in contributing to cancer progression in the lung. So stay tuned. That's super Ooh. cool. And we should definitely that do cool. that paper on autoimmunity at some point, but I'll put a link in the show notes so you can find it because it'll be out by the time this episode gets posted. You can also find some of us on Twitter, me, Camilla, and Che Dean. Um, some more active than others, but I'm, I'm Other learning. social media <laughs> stuff. Mostly just go to Facebook, go to Patreon, say hello. Um, and yeah, that's it. Oh, and the music at the beginning at the beginning and the end of the show is uh, written and performed by uh, my wife, Rachel Reinick. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.